Hey guys, welcome to another lecture video for Chem 115. In this video, we will continue our discussion of polyprotic acids and polyprotic base. More specifically, we will look at how to calculate the pH of a solution if a polyprotic base is present. So let's get started. To demonstrate um, this topic, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this problem. And so it reads that if 1.518 moles of potassium carbonate is found in a 2 liter solution, we want to determine the pH of the solution. And then we're also going to determine the equilibrium concentrations for carbonate, bicarbonate, hydroxide, carbonic acid, and hydrogen ions. Um, lastly, it looks like this problem gave us some Ka values. So here we have Ka1 is equal to 1.30 times 10 to the negative 7, and Ka2 is equal to 1.30 times 10 to the negative 11. So let's go ahead and start. To determine the pH of the solution, very similar to the other uh, videos, um, the other ways I've, I've solved these types of problems in other videos, is that I need to be able to determine the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen. And so that's typically uh, determined by you know, solving for x in the mass action expression. And so for us to write a mass action expression, we did an ice table. And for us to develop our ice table, we need to determine a chemical equation, or we need to be able to write a balanced chemical equation. So it looks like this is the first step that we're going to have to perform. So to write a chemical equation, we need to know what uh, reaction or what reactants are going to be, uh, what reactants we are going to be using. And so reading through this problem, we see that we have potassium carbonate. So potassium carbonate is an ionic salt. And if you were to write its chemical formula, it's going to be K2CO3. Okay. Um, and so based on what we learned from uh, one of the lecture videos that, that I did, uh, we're going to determine whether or not potassium is going to affect the pH of the solution or carbonate is going to affect the pH of the solution. Remember, this is an ionic salt. And so here I'm just going to go ahead and put down that we have one a mole of potassium carbonate. And then we're going to go ahead and place this ionic salt in water. And that produces two moles of potassium and one mole of carbonate. And so according to um, rule one of determining whether or not ions of an ionic salt is going to affect the pH of a solution, since potassium is a group 1A element, according to rule one, then it will not have an effect. Uh, this ion, potassium, has no effect on pH. And so um, we're going to go ahead and completely ignore potassium for um, the entire problem. And so let's go ahead and look at carbonate. So carbonate is a weak base. And according to our rules, um, a weak base does affect the pH of the solution. Okay. 
And so from here on out, um, our calculations is going to reflect that of carbonate since we've determined that it does affect the pH of the solution. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to write the ionization, the, the chemical equations that represents the first ionization of carbonate and the second ionization of um, carbonate. And so there are two ionization steps because here in this case, the charge is negative two. So this is a polyprotic base. And so the first ionization can be written as carbonate reacting with a solvent water to produce bicarbonate and hydroxide. And so since we're talking about the ionization of, a, of the base, and since this is referring to the first ionization, we're going to represent the forward uh, reaction as KB1. Now, the second ionization, the second ionization step is going to take the product bicarbonate, since it still has that negative one, and it's going to ionize another water molecule, gaining its hydrogen, and therefore producing another hydroxide. And since there is no more charges on carbonic acid, then we no longer need to write a third ionization step. We're just going to go ahead and stop here. And so since this chemical equation is referring to the second ionization of the base, um, the forward direction is going to represent Kb2. So to calculate um, the concentration of hydrogen ions um, so that we can get the pH, it looks like we'll probably have to determine the equilibrium concentration of the hydroxide after both uh, ionization steps have occurred. Um, and so let's go ahead and start our calculations. So I'm going to take this first ionization step and I'm going to go ahead and just copy it below. And since we want to determine the equilibrium concentration of this hydroxide after the first ionization step, that tells us that we're going to have to build an ice table and we have to write a mass action expression. And so um, I went ahead and pre-wrote the ice table for the first ionization. And remember, this first ionization is going to represent KB1. And since the solvent is water, the physical state of matter is liquid, allowing us to ignore this whole column when we're trying to figure out the mass action expression. Or when, when we try to, uh, when we write the mass action expression, we're going to ignore anything that's pure liquid or solid. Only aqueous and gas states are considered. All right, so the next step is to fill in our chart. And so there, uh, looking at our chart, we need an initial concentration of carbonate. And so to get an initial concentration, we're going to go ahead and look at our um, problem. And so we have 1.518 moles of potassium carbonate in two liter of solution. And so if we have 1.158 moles of potassium carbonate, we want to express this value specifically only for carbonate. And so if we're looking at the overall chemical equation, notice how we have one mole of potassium carbonate. And so um, it, it, since the coefficient for carbonate, which is the focus of our calculation, is also one mole, then this is a one to one uh, mole to mole ratio. And so this is telling us that we also have 1.518 moles of carbonate. 
Now, if we divide this by le uh, the volume, which is 2.00 liters, we can get molarity. And the molarity is going to be 0 0.759. And so this is going to be the m initial molar concentration of our carbonate ion. So we're going to put in 0 0.759 molar concentration. Now, if, um, if this number was 2, then we would have to multiply our value by 2, okay? since the ratio would then be 1 to 2. All right. And so since carbonate is a weak base, and you know that it's a weak base, because it's not on the list of strong acids that I am having you guys uh, be very, very, very familiar with. Um, so since it's a weak base, this is telling us that the change is going to be minus x, specifically minus 1x, because the coefficient is 1. And so the, since we're going to consume some amount of carbonate, that means we're going to produce some amount of bicarbonate, so that's represented as plus 1x, and some amount of hydroxide, that's plus 1x. And so if you add down, this is 0 0.759 minus x plus x plus x. Okay. So now that we have expressions, um, the equal, now that we have the equilibrium expression for carbonate, equilibrium expression for bicarbonate, equilibrium expression for hydroxide, we can go ahead and uh, create a mass action expression and plug in these variables. And so the mass action expression is simply going to be what I wrote down, such that it's the ratio of products over reactants raised to its coefficient. And since the coefficient is 1 to 1 to 1, then the exponent, or the, um, exponent is going to be 1 to 1 to 1. All right. And so we can go ahead and plug in um, uh, these, these x's into the place where they belong in the mass action expression. And so we're going to take the x's and put them inside uh, their corresponding bracket. Um, such that we get KB1 is equal to x times x over 0.759 minus x. And so I can go ahead and combine both of these x's together so that I get x squared. So x times x is x squared, not 2x. All right, and so for me to solve this problem further, I need to figure out what KB1 is. So looking at uh, the given equilibrium constant values or ionization constant values, uh, notice that we are not given KB, but we're given KA. And so we have to think about the relationship of KA and KB for a diprotic uh, base or a polyprotic base. And so if you guys recall from um, the previous lecture video, I went through that derivation. And one way that you guys can memorize the relationship between Ka and Kb for polyprotic acids and bases is simply writing out um, the Ka's first so you're going to make a statement saying that Ka1 is at the top. And remember, this is like the first, so this is the first ionization step. And the second ionization step is going to be Ka2. Okay. And so I'm putting Ka, Ka, and then put 1 and 2. Okay. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and kind of erase this for now. Um, and so one way to memorize the relationship between Ka and Kb 
is uh, by inverting the, the position of the numbers. And so Ka times Kb we know is equal to Kw. And Ka times Kb we know is equal to Kw. And so if the 1 is uh, at the top, then we're going to go ahead and flip its position, so to speak, so that KB1 is at the bottom. And since 2 is at the bottom, then we're going to go ahead and flip its position and put KB2 at the top. Okay. Um, and so the full derivation for this relationship can be uh, reviewed in my in, in the previous video before this. All right, so this is telling me that if I want to determine KB1, oops, then that means I have to use KA2. And so KB1 is equal to KW over Ka2. So I'm dividing Ka2 on the, to the other side. And so Kb1 is going to be 1.008 times 10 to the negative 14. And so we're going to assume that this uh, reaction is going to happen at 25 degrees Celsius. I don't think I said it explicitly um, in the problem. And so we're just going to assume that we're at this temperature. Now the value for Ka2 is going to be 1.30 times 10 to the negative 11. And so if I calculate that out, um, Kb1 is going to be 7.75 times 10 to the negative 4. So now that I've solved for KB1, I'm going to go ahead and plug that in to my mass action expression. So 7.75 times that by 10 to the negative 4 is equal to x squared over 0.759 minus x. And so if you leave this um, equation alone, you guys are going to get a quadratic, and that's something that we want to try to avoid. And so we're going to go ahead and ask ourselves um, the question, can we ignore the x in the denominator? And the answer is yes. And the reason why is because the initial concentration is greater than Kb1 times 100. And so the initial concentration is 0.759. And if you take Kb1 and multiply it by 100, you're going to get 0 0.0759. Um, or 7.59 times 10 to the negative 2. And so since this statement is true, we can go ahead and ignore the x in the denominator. And we can go ahead and put in 7.75 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to x squared over 0.759. And we're going to go ahead and multiply this 0.759 to the other side, giving us 5.88 times 10 to the negative 4. And that's going to equal to x squared. Now I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides. And that gives me the value of x, which is going to be 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. And so I'm trying to keep three sig figs as I work through the problem. And so now that I've solved for the value of x, I can go ahead and kind of summarize um, the equilibrium concentration after the first ionization. And so uh, I'm going to determine the equilibrium concentration 
for carbonate after the first ionization. Same thing with bicarbonate and same thing with the hydroxide. So I'm just going to go ahead and write down after the first ionization the equilibrium concentration of carbonate is defined as 0.75 9 minus x. So this is coming from the um, ice table, okay. the E. And so I'm just going to go ahead and um, highlight this value, so that's x, and it's just going to serve as a reminder that I'm going to plug in this number into x. So when I do that, um, and if I round to the correct number of sig figs, I get 0 0.734 molar. Oops. Okay. And so this is telling me that this is the equilibrium concentration of carbonate. And so if I want to determine the equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate, which is the next compound in my chemical equation, that's simply going to be defined as x. And so since x is 2.43 times 10 to negative 2, I'm just going to go ahead and plug that in and make sure I'm placing my unit. And I'll box that for now. And so the last thing I want to determine is the equilibrium concentration of my hydroxide after the first ionization. And if you look at the ice table, um, notice that it's defined as X as well. And so in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and plug in that value. And this would be the equilibrium concentration of my hydroxide. Just to be consistent, I'm going to go ahead and highlight these x's in yellow, reminding me that I'm going to plug in that number into each and every single one of those x's. All right. And so um, if you guys recall from at the end of the first video of this specific topic, um, polyprotic acids and polyprotic bases. Um, at the very end of that video, we compared and contrast the equilibrium concentrations uh, between the first and the second ionization and found that there was no significant difference. And so, therefore, we're going to treat um, our calculations of polyprotic acids and bases as if they were monoprotic. In other words, after the first ice table or the first ionization, um, we have all of the values that we need to determine the pH of the solution. In addition, the, uh, we can go ahead and make another assumption such that the equilibrium concentration of um, in this case carbonic acid is equal to KB2. And then we'll talk more about this in just a second, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, but the main idea is that f from you know, the, the first ionization, after the first ionization is performed, um, we can calculate the pH automatically. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then I'll go ahead and do the second round of ice table. And um, we'll, we'll go through, that, through those motions and then compare those values just to kind of solidify uh, this point. Uh, we're just going to prove that this assumption is going to be correct. Okay. 
And so since we have the equilibrium concentration of hydroxide that can uh, give us the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen ions through this relationship, And if I solve for H plus, I get Kw is equal to the constant, or divi is divided by the concentration of OH minus. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and plug in my values. So this is going to be 1.008 times 10 to the negative 14. And I'm going to go ahead and divide that by the equilibrium concentration of OH, which in this case is 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. And so if I divide those values in my calculator, um, I am going to get 4.15 times 10 to the negative 13. And so if you look at the, the, the magnitude, this is the concentration of H plus at equilibrium. So this is a very small number. So this is telling us that it's not very acidic. The solution is not very acidic it's probably going to be very basic. And so therefore our pH should be greater than seven. Uh, and that kind of makes sense because if you look at the uh, first ionization of this base, we produce hydroxide. And so for producing hydroxide, it's going to make our solution more basic. And so to calculate the pH, we're gonna go ahead and take the negative log of this value. So we're going to plug in this concentration. Let me put in molarity just to be consistent. And I'm going to go ahead and plug it into this space. And so if I take the negative log of 4.15 times 10 to the negative 13, uh, the answer that I'm going to get is 12.382. Once again, I'm going to report three decimal places because I have three sig figs. And so um, this is going to be the pH of the solution. Now notice how it's greater than seven, just like what I predicted, uh, just because the concentration of hydrogen ion is very, very low. Um, and so our solution is basic. All right, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight a couple things here. Um, the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen ion is 4.15 times 10 to negative 13. The pH is 12.382. Um, the let me use a different highlighter, different color for the highlighter. The equilibrium concentration of carbonate is this value. The equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate is this value. And the equilibrium concentration of OH is this value after the first ionization. Okay. And so um, if you look back at the questions that I asked, did we determine the pH of the solution? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and mark that check mark with a different color. So I'll do it in pink. So did I determine the pH of the solution? Yes. Uh, did I determine the equilibrium concentration of carbonate? Yes. Did I determine the equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate? Yes. Hydroxide? Yes. Hydrogen ions? Yes. Um, carbonic acid is a no. We have not yet determined the equilibrium concentration of carbonic acid. And so if you look at our chemical equations uh, that we've that I've kind of I've pre-written, H2CO3 is carbonic acid. And um, that H2CO3 is only present after we ionize our water a second time around by using bicarbonate as our base. And so there's two ways that we can go about this. Uh, we can go ahead and predict the equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate by determining the value of Kb2. 
And so um, if we determine the value of Kb2, then we can automatically determine the equilibrium concentration of H2CO3. So that's the assumption. And so we're going to go ahead and check that assumption by performing a second round of our ice table. But let's go ahead and figure out um, what the concentration of H2CO3 is by determining the value of Kb2. Um, and so notice that the problem didn't give us Kb values. They gave us Ka values, so K1 and K2. And so we already used Ka2. Oops for the first ionization. Okay. Um, and so that means we're going to use Ka1 to determine our second ionization. And we can go ahead and, oops, we can go ahead and uh, use that or determine that by looking at the relationships between Ka and Kb for polyprotic acids and polyprotic bases. And so, if I wanted to solve for Kb2, then I need to use Ka1. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. So here I'm going to say that the equilibrium, I'm going to assume that the equilibrium concentration of carbonic acid is going to be defined by Kb2. And so for me to determine Kb2, I need to use this relationship. Ka1 times Kb2 is equal to Kw. And if I solve for Kb2, I get Kw divided by Ka1. And so that's going to be 1.008 times 10 to the negative 14. Divide this by Ka1, which is 1.30 times 10 to the negative 7. So this is going to be 1 point... Um, what was K1 again? Oh, 1.30. Okay. So 1.30 times 10 to the negative 7. Let me check that real quick. Yeah. And so if you plug that into your calculator, the value of Kb2 is going to be uh, 7.75 times that by 10 to the negative 8. And so if this is the value for Kb2, then this must be the concentration of carbonic acid at equilibrium. And so the concentration of carbonic acid at equilibrium is equal to 7.75 times 10 to the negative 8 molar. So notice that we're making all of these assumptions without doing a, an ice table, um, simply because in the previous video, I showed you that after we did the second ionization, the numbers uh, don't really change too much. And so to prove this assumption correct, uh, I am going to show you the work for the second ionization. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy this equation for now because I need it to develop my second ice table. Okay. So I'm just going to erase some stuff here.
So I'm going to go ahead and take my carbonate. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and allow it to ionize uh, hydrogen from water, producing carbonic acid and another hydroxide ion. And since we want to determine the equilibrium concentration, we need to develop another ice table. All right, so since the physical state of matter of this water is liquid, we're going to ignore this completely. And uh, we need to figure out what the initial concentration of bicarbonate is. Uh, and so if you recall, this is the second ionization. And so the start of the second ionization um, piggybacks off of the end of the first ionization. And so if the equilibrium concentration after the first ionization of bicarbonate is 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2, this must be the initial concentration for my second ice table. So it's going to be uh, 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. Molar. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and consume some amount. We don't know. Uh, and then we're going to produce some amount of each of these products. And we don't know until we solve for x. And so we're going to go ahead and write uh, or develop um, an equilibrium expression. I should have made this a little bit wider here. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug some stuff into that space. So it's going to be 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 minus x. So all of this, uh, let me erase this. So this whole expression is going to be plugged into here. I just didn't um, give myself enough room. All right. And so the mass action expression, I'm going to go ahead and skip a couple steps here, is simply going to be x times x, or x squared, over uh, 2.43. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me take one step back. Um, okay. And so... Let's go ahead and take a look at hydroxide. Um, and so hydroxide was actually produced after the first ionization. And so after the first ionization, we do have some amount of hydroxide. And that also needs to be taken into account um, as our initial concentration. So we have 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. So therefore, the equilibrium, con uh, the equilibrium expression is going to be 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 plus x. Okay. And so if I want to write a mass action expression using the equations that defines each component at equilibrium. I'm going to go ahead and take x and multiply it by this term. So the x times 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 plus x. And then in the denominator, it's going to be simply 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 minus x, right? So that's this term right here. And this is going to represent KB2. And so since KB2 is 7.75 times 10 to the negative 8, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate this. So I don't have to rewrite it again. Um, so this, this equation looks absolutely intimidating. There's a lot of things going on. And so what we want to do is make some assumptions in regards to the overall change. And so if I look at the magnitude of our equilibrium constant, Kb2, 
uh, or uh, our ionization constant, Kb2, notice that it's times 10 to the negative 8. So it's a very, very small number. And so we're going to go ahead and assume that this actual change compared to this value is going to be minuscule. Um, but we're not going to just stop there. Notice that this value, this, this number, is also being compared to the change. And if we're assuming that the change is um, very small, then adding this value into this number is not going to change this number by, by very much. And so remember, this is times 10 to the negative 8. That's very, very, very small. Um, and so wh what we're going to do is we are going to ignore these two x's. However, we are, go we are going to keep this x because this x, the equilibrium concentration of carbonic acid, is not being compared against an original concentration. There's nothing here. So anything greater than zero is significant. And so when we um, ignore the x values, that leaves us with 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2, 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. So that's going to cancel as well. So here in this case, x is going to be 7.75. Oh, wait, am I using the right? Yeah, I am. OK. So 7.75 times 10 to the negative 8 is equal to x. And so um, since x represents uh, the, the, the change, so to speak, we're going to go ahead and plug that into all the x's that we see. And so after the second ionization, we need to tabulate what the equilibrium concentration is of bicarbonate, carbonic acid, and hydroxide. And so after the second ionization, the equilibrium concentration of HCO3 negative is defined as 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 minus x. And so um, I am going to go ahead and plug this value into x. And if you plug that value in your calculator, your calculator should spew out 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. This change is so small that it doesn't affect the value of this um, uh, of it doesn't change the the overall value of it. And so this is going to be the equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate after the second ionization. And so for carbonic acid, the equilibrium concentration is defined as X according to my ice table. And so therefore, since the x value after the second ionization is 7.75 times 10 to the negative 8, that's going to be the concentration for carbonic acid. Last but not least, the equilibrium concentration for hydroxide 
is going to be 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2 plus x. Oops. And so if you were to plug in uh, this value here, 7.75, into this x and this x, um, you guys are, so if you plug it into to this equation, um, the answer is still going to be 2.43 times 10 to the negative 2. Just because that value times 10 to the negative 8 is very, very small. And so now that we have um, the uh, equilibrium concentrations for these components, for these substances after the second ionization, I'm going to go ahead and see if my assumptions were correct now that I did all of my work. And so you guys do not need to do this um, all the time, but I'm just going to go ahead and just copy this stuff. All right, and so uh, looking at um, specifically what's in common between the first and the second ionization, so I'm going to go ahead and just erase some of these uh, highlights. Um, bum, 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 bum. I'll just go ahead and do orange this time. And so notice that HCO3 is found um, in both ionization steps, uh, or the equilibrium concentration of uh, bicarbonate is found in, in both. And so if you look at the values, it's the same. And so OH minus is also present in uh, the first and the second ionization. And if you look at their values, they're the same. The only ones that are unique so to speak, is uh, the is, it's going to be carbonic acid and carbonate. Um, actually, I should not highlight that in pink. Let's just go ahead and do yellow. Okay. Um. And so, at the very beginning of, oh, I'm sorry, wrong arrows. And so when I was making these assumptions after I calculated the equilibrium concentrations after the first ionization, I was correct in those assumptions after I did my full calculation. And so hopefully you guys can, can see that you guys can go ahead and, and do some, apply some shortcuts, if you will. Make some assumptions after you perform the first ionization of your polyprotic acid or polyprotic base. So long story short, you guys are going to treat them as if they're monoprotic acids and monoprotic bases. And you can uh, only do um, one ice table if you want to and then make those assumptions. Now, if you guys are kind of... Um, if you guys want to fully show your work and you want to not make those assumptions, you guys can go ahead and do a second ice table. The only thing that I do advise if you guys are going to do a second ice table is make sure that you have the initial concentrations for both the conjugate and that of the second hydroxide or hydrogen ion um, placed. If you guys don't have these two values, then your ice table is definitely going, is definitely going to look wonky and um, uh, some mistakes will occur. <clears throat> All right. So hopefully you guys 
um, kind of understand how to tackle, how to solve for the pH and the equilibrium concentrations for a polyprotic base. Um, so that's pretty much it for polyprotic bases and polyprotic acids. The next topic that I'm going to discuss are buffers. All right, um, I'll see you guys later.